Okay, uh, so just want to say um, your exams were really good, your papers were really good, you know, I have no complaints, nothing that I'm particularly worried about here. Um, <clears throat> do you guys have any questions about any midterm stuff or past assignments or anything like that? I do have a comment. Yes. Um, this version of the, I had to buy another version of the book because I left my other one in t seven hours from here in Tennessee. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I went and got the book that the, um, the GSW bookstore had on file. Okay. Now I love the, um, the set it came in. I'm, I'm glad I had that set. Uh huh. The one critique I have is the cover. I hate, <laughs> I hate this cover and where it came from. Yeah, and I, I, I get, you know, that they, you know, they're trying to cross promote the film and the book, right? It's like, hey, this was a movie too, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I sort of feel like. I have some strong feelings about uh, the Hobbit movies in particular. Um, for one thing, the numbing level of violence um, in the final movie. Um, and also, just look like I, I sort of feel like it gets a lot of things about the way Tolkien builds Bilbo's character wrong. Um, you know, I think it turns Bilbo into a more kind of conventional hero, when I feel like part of the point of the novel is that he's not really a conventional hero, right? That he doesn't quite belong. And this is, you know, one of, the, one of the possible readings of the book that we're going to discuss is that Bilbo doesn't really quite belong to the world of elf lords and wizards and questing dwarves and aristocratic heroes, right? that he is kind of coming from a different uh, and really kind of more modern tradition, right? So, you know, why don't I actually start there by returning to that Northrop Fry scheme that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, right? Which I still have reservations about, but which I do think is useful for understanding uh, fantasy narratives in particular. So. You'll recall we have you know myth, romance, the high mimetic, the low mimetic, and the ironic as our sort of genre possibilities, right? You know, in Fry's scheme of things. And each of these has to do with the relationship between the hero, other people, and the environment, right? So what do we remember about these labels, right? In Fry's scheme, what is a myth? What kind of hero, uh, or what kind of protagonist do we see in a myth? Divine ancestry, demigods. Yeah, gods and demigods and myths, right? Yep. Right? We could be talking about an actual god like Thor or someone who is descended from a god like, uh, like Heracles, right? So yeah, th th these are heroes who are at least partly divine and so are different from other people in kind, right? What about romance? Chivalry, knights. Yep. Uh, courtly love. Knights. Chivalry, courtly love, yep. I watched Monty Python over the weekend. <laughs> uh, finally got through it. That was a fun movie. <laughs> it is a fun movie. <laughs> no, it's not going to count. Watch it as a silly place. <laughs> but I think what, what, what Monty Python is doing is they're taking what is essentially romance material and making it ironic, right? Because the knights are foolish and incompetent and don't really understand anything about the world around them, right? But yeah, so the romance hero is of high social status, right, is a, is a human, but of high status, 
and superior, often supernatural ability. Right? The heroes of most romances aren't just knights, right? They're always superlative knights, right? They're the best knights. They're better than everybody else. And many of them even have sort of supernatural powers, right? Like, uh, you know, for example, in a lot of the romances about Sir Gawain, um, his strength waxes as the sun approaches its zenith and then wanes as it starts to set. Now, what about the high mimetic? What are we talking about with the high mimetic? What's a high mimetic hero look like? I have to switch to a long notebook. So a high mimetic hero is superior to other people, but not to his environment, right? So someone of high social status. but not necessarily with any special abilities. All right, no superpowers. Um, so if you take, um, say, a figure uh, like Oedipus out of Greek tragedy, right? So you know, Oedipus has no divine parentage, he has no special abilities, but he is a figure of very high social standing, right? Um, Greek tragedies usually center, center around these kinds of people, as do uh, you know, most uh, of their descendants in the English Renaissance, right? The low mimetic concerns ordinary people. This is the basic mode of things like 19th century realism. And the ironic deals with protagonists who are of inferior status, who are also inferior to the environment. So a good example of the ironic mode in Fry's scheme would be something like Kafka's Metamorphosis, right? Are either of you familiar with that particular text? Okay, so yeah, so we've got you know the the, the protagonist Gregor Samsa wakes up to find that he's been transformed into a giant cockroach, right? Now Gregor never seeks to understand his condition or to figure out how he's become a cockroach, or you know the larger existential issues surrounding this. Like he just, he wakes up and he tries to roll out of bed, put his coat back on and catch his train to go to work, right? Like he is fully aware at this time that he is a cockroach, but it doesn't seem to be his main problem, right? He's still treating his main problem as the fact that he has to get to work. So his lack of recognition, um, combined with his powerlessness compared to other people, makes him an ironic hero, right? So we see this often in modernism and in experimental postmodern literature. Now, Bilbo Baggins in these schemes is usually described as a low mimetic hero. Operating in either a romance or a high mimetic world, right? So Bilbo's own comfortable little hobbit hole occupies this kind of Victorian realist end of the spectrum. But from that hobbit hole, he goes out and experiences um, a kind of wider romance world, right? That is full of monsters and heroes and all kinds of supernatural beings and events. So in many ways, what we have here is kind of like the classic fish out of water narrative. 
But Bilbo also grows into his role over time, right? So we're also looking at an example of what literary scholars call a Bildungsroman. Are either of you uh, familiar with this term? I'm, I've seen it. I'm gonna guess at its definition of, be, of building a hero. You're, right, you're thinking along the right lines, yeah. So Bildungsroman, if we translate literally from the German, more or less literally, means development novel. Right, Roman being novel, the French and the Germans still use the old term romance to refer to any lengthy prose narrative. And Bildung uh, being concerned with building and development, yep. So yeah, so a Bildungsroman is concerned with the development of the protagonist. And usually these are concerned with you know, the process of maturity, right? Right, they go from innocence or childhood to maturity. And so it might be useful for us to look then at where Bilbo starts out. What do we make of, of uh, Bilbo Baggins and Hobbits generally uh, at the beginning of the novel? They're neat. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yep, they're tidy, yes. Plump. They like good food. Yep. Yep, they like good food and comfort, right? Creature comforts. Yeah. That's a good phrase. Yeah, they like they, they, they like food. They like um, you know they like good drink. They like smoking their pipes, right? They like nice clothes and comfortable homes. In fact, like in the first page, um, describes a hobbit hole. Yeah, this is what a hobbit hole looks like, right? In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a bare, dry, standy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green, with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened on to a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel. We can see why some scholars read this as being like a womb, right? A very comfortable tunnel without smoke, with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs, and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The Hobbit was fond of visitors. Okay, you typically don't get a lot of visitors in a room, right? The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly but not quite straight into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people from many miles round called it, and many little round doors opened out of it, first on one side and then on another. No going upstairs for the hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of these. Wardrobes, he had whole rooms devoted to clothes. Kitchens, dining rooms, all were on the same floor and indeed on the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side going in, for these were the only ones to have windows. Deep set round windows looking out over his garden and meadows beyond sloping down to the river. So there are a couple of things we can pull out of this, right? You know, apart from the womb-like structure here, like, you know, what, what, what is, we get a sense of abundance, right? This hobbit has, like, he lives by himself here, but he's got lots of room and lots of stuff, right? Almost like a warder. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if it's just you, why do you need whole rooms dedicated to clothes? Yeah, good question, and right? And you know, if it's, I understand that hobbits eat a lot, but still, sure. it's just you. Why yeah. do you need 
multiple pantries and cellars. <laughs> uh huh. Just for himself, right? And even when he takes on Frodo. Mm -hmm. it's sure, who, who still, hasn't even been dreamed of at the point yeah. that Tolkien is writing this novel, right? It's still, it's like, why do you need all of this? It's kind of hoarding wealth. Yeah, exactly. And he kind of, he, he's... A almost like what kind of creature? A dragon. Yes, very good. <laughs> that was also kind of snooty. What, what would make you say snooty? Why, why, why snooty? Because of his heritage, he's a took and a baggage. Uh huh. And the Tooks are like royalty amongst the hobbits. But they're not quite respectable, right? And they're not quite respectable <laughs> because, unlike other hobbits, uh -huh. they like adventures. Yes, the Tooks sometimes go on adventures, yes. So they are less respectable than the Bagginses. And I think, you know, this, this push and pull between Baggins and Took nature yeah. um, is frequently referenced, right? Whenever, um, we'll notice um, even in the second half of the book, when, whenever. Bilbo puts himself on a kind of business footing. He likes to quote his father, right? You know, as my father used to say, and then he'll spout out some cliche that is related to business in some way, right? Whereas, yeah, the more imaginative, adventurous side of him is that took side that comes from his mother, right? His mother being the only woman who is mentioned in the novel, right? That's another thing to note here is that this is basically an all-male world. Uh, I think towards the end of the first chapter or the second one, he, um, after he's settled all the doors and he's on his way to bed, the tookishness is starting to wear off. Uh huh. Because the whole time the doors are discussing the plans, he even says the took side of him leans forward. Uh huh. In a manner, um, and as he's going off to bed, it starts to wear off, and the bag inside starts uh -huh. to pop back in. Yeah, that took side, that imaginative side, right? That adventurous side. Which is also in some ways associated with magic, right? Mm -hmm. We're told that, um, you know, uh, one of the Tooks may have taken a fairy wife at some point, right? Fairy in um, Tolkien's conception, meaning elf here. And also that the old Took had a pair of magic diamond studs that uh, the Gandalf had given him, right? That would only unfasten themselves if you took them. Yes. So the Tooks are associated here yeah, kind of with, with magic as well, right? Now let's look at what this first chapter has to say about the Bagginses. This hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit. And his name was Baggins. The Bagginses had lived in the neighborhood of the hill for time out of mind, and people considered them very respectable, not only because most of them were rich, but also because they never had any adventures or did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on any question without the bother of asking it. Yeah. Their primary characteristic is predictability, right? And they're also clearly like very settled, right? They've lived in the neighborhood of the hill for time out of mind, right? They have always been in this place. They don't go anywhere. So we have this push and pull in this character between these two different impulses that are represented uh, by these different sides of his parentage, right? Now I think it's also probably, worth, if we're looking at this as a kind of development novel, it's also probably worth looking at um, the physical description of hobbits. Right? What are the no what are the most noteworthy elements, particularly here on page two, of the physical description we're given of hobbits? They don't have beards. No beards. Yep. Um, 
They are inclined to be fat in the stomach. Okay, they're, you've got, they've got no beards. All right, they're a little bit on the chubby side. They naturally grow leathery soles and thick brown hair on their feet. Okay. <laughs> Have clever, long, clever brown fingers, good-natured faces, and deep laughs. Uh huh. And they dress in green and yellow mainly. Mm hmm. What about their height? How tall are they? Half the height of. of um, yeah, no, they're about half human height, right? Oh, and they can turn invisible. Or nearly so. Yes. Or nearly so. <laughs> so the deep, pretty laughs, the good-natured faces, right? That all references um, English country folk, right? But what about the lack of beards and being half human height? Children. Children. Yeah, exactly. Little chubby people with no beards who are half human height, yep. In fact, when Bilbo goes off with the dwarves, uh, let's see, where is the, uh, right, on page 30, last paragraph there, right? That's how they all came to start, jogging off from the inn one fine morning just before May on laden ponies. And Bilbo was wearing a dark green hood, a little weather stained, and a dark green cloak borrowed from Dwalin. They were too large for him, and he looked rather comic. What his father Bungo would have thought of him, I daren't think. His only comfort was he couldn't be mistaken for a dwarf, as he had no beard. So he looks ridiculous in dwarf clothes, right? In part because they, they simply don't fit him. He's too small. He hasn't grown into the role yet. And I think that you know, the fact that his beardlessness is noted here as well, yet again, indicates that lack of maturity. Now, I do want to focus, because I, I, I think that this exchange is important enough um, that I, I, have actually, I have actually published an article on this, um, <clears throat> where uh, Bilbo and Gandalf go back and forth about the semantics of good morning. <laughs> because I think that this indicates something actually very important about these characters and about the novels, right? So one thing we have to remember is Tolkien's professional interest in language, right? So here, we have Bilbo reading his mail on a bright morning, right? All that the unsuspecting Bilbo saw that morning was an old man with a staff. He had a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, a silver scarf over which his long white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. Good morning said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining, and the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean, he said. Do you wish me a good morning, or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not, or that you feel good on this morning, or that it is a morning to be good on? So, what is Gandalf pointing out about Bilbo's good morning? It has multiple meanings. Yeah. So, Bilbo, when Bilbo says good morning, right, he meant it, right? But it's not entirely clear to the person he said, the person he good mornings, right, what he meant. So, Bilbo... seems to be representing here what is commonly referred to as the transparent theory of language. The 
that is that there's a clear association or a clear relationship between words and the objects that they reference, right? And that the meaning of any particular linguistic utterance is thus clear and obvious. Gandalf, on the other hand, is pointing out that meaning is always indeterminate. without context. That that good morning can mean anything unless you establish a proper context for it. Right, if we look on page five, we get another good morning, right? And this time it's clear to Gandalf what Bilbo meant, right? The old man did not move. He stood leaning on a stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything, till Bilbo got quite uncomfortable and even a little cross. Good morning, he said at last. We don't want any adventures here, thank you. You might try over the hill or across the water. By this he meant that the conversation was at an end. What a lot of things you do use good morning for, said Gandalf. Now you mean that you want to get rid of me and that it won't be good till I move off. So... In this case, through his behavior, right, he says good morning, ignores the other person and starts doing something else. He's made it clear what he means, right? Go away. Yeah. <laughs> He's provided a context here, which Gandalf has correctly read, right? Not at all, not at all, my dear sir. Let me see, I don't think I know your name. Yes, yes, my dear sir, and I do know your name, Mr. Bilbo Baggins, and you do know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. To think that I should have lived to be good morning by Belladonna Took's son, as if I was selling buttons at the door. Now, <clears throat> this is another kind of interesting phrase here. Right? This, I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. So there's a particular uh, theory of language, um, it's called structuralism, and when <laughs> Tolkien was a young professor uh, working at the University of Leeds and then at Oxford, structuralism was making a big splash in European departments of linguistics. So the basic premise of structuralism is that a sign, which you know can be a word, basically any kind of symbol, right, is made up of two elements. Right? A signifier that is the symbol itself, combined with the signified, right? That is the object or concept that the, that, that the sign represents, right? So these two things put together equal a sign. What Kind of like what is like what does Gandalf's statement here have to do with this linguistic relationship? What is he doing here when he says, "I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me"? He's telling Bilbo his name. Mm -hmm. I am Gandalf. Gandalf. Uh huh. And he's also just making sure he understands that when you hear the name Gandalf, this is who you should think of. Maybe. <laughs> I, don't. I, th I think, like, go, go ahead. He's stating his name 
Yeah. And then he's explaining that whenever you hear the name, that is me. I am this. I am the sign Gandalf, and understand that this sign Gandalf means me. Yeah. Essentially, what he is is a sign, right? Gandalf is himself a sign, right? He is both the name and the thing signified by the name, right? This also kind of like speaks to his uniqueness within the world. Now, this happens again in the Riddles in the Dark chapter. We get a similar idea. When Bilbo first meets Gollum, We look on page 71. Deep down here by the dark water lived old Gollum, a small, slimy creature. I don't know where he came from, nor who or what he was. He was Gollum, as dark as darkness except for two big, round, pale eyes in his thin face. He had a little boat, and he rode about quietly on the lake, for lake it was, wide and deep and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make. Not he. He was looking out of his pale, lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers quick as thinking. So, you know, the, the rest of this doesn't particularly work for a point here, right? But like, what, what is Gollum? An emaciated hobbit. Well, that's not really quite established. Like, that's established later in The Lord of the Rings, right? He's an exile. Yeah, he is a Rekka creature, right? We know from what it says about him later on that uh, he is exiled from his original home, right? Uh, yeah, let's uh, go to page 73, right? <clears throat> Riddles were all I could think of, asking them and sometimes guessing them had been the only game he had ever played with other funny creatures sitting in their holes in the long, long ago, before he lost all his friends and was driven away alone and crept down, down into the dark under the mountains. Right, so yeah, not unlike Fafnir or Grendel, right? Especially given that he's a human-like creature. So Go yeah, Gollum does fit that Rekka mode. And I don't know why None of the markers in this room are any good anymore. But I think that there's, there's, in a way, he's similar to Gandalf as well here, right? So he doesn't declare himself Gollum, right? But is there another Gollum? Yeah, there's two. There's duality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which again is developed in the in the sequel, right? He talks to himself down here a little bit, right? But he doesn't have the two distinct personalities, right? Mm -hmm. He's just like, the way he's described, like, he was Gollum, right? I don't know where he came from, nor who or what he was. He was Gollum. So we have, again, a total identification here of the signifier with the signified, right? This is a sign that refers to this specific creature. And the reason I point this out is because so much of Bilbo's early success and his um, development has to do with coming to master language in various ways. So at the beginning, he has very little control over language, right? Uh, most of his attempts to talk his way out of trouble, for example, um, end up being disastrous. Uh, let's... The trolls? Yeah, the trolls, right? Yeah, what, what's, what's, what's probably... Like, what happens with the trolls when he tries to... Uh, when he tries to bargain with them? I'm a bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually creates another kind of unique signifier here, right? Accidentally, right? 
If we look on page 36, right, the, the purse says, you know, here, here, who are you? Why me, bird? Look what I've caught, said William. What is it? Said the others coming up. Lummy if I knows. What are you? Bilbo Baggins, a bird, a hobbit, said poor Bilbo, shaking all over and wondering how to make owl noises before they throttled him. A bird, a hobbit, said they a bit startled. Trolls are slow in the uptake and mighty suspicious about anything new to them. What's a bird, a hobbit, got to do with my pocket anyway, said William. And can you cook them, said Tom. You can try, said Bert, picking up a skewer. All right, so the Burra Hobbit here is the result of a mistake, right? Or an attempt to cover a mistake in language, right? What was, where does the Burra Hobbit come from? He's going to say burglar. Yeah. But, you know, one, he realizes that it's not really, uh, it's probably not a good idea to identify yourself as a burglar to the people you were trying to burgle, right? Yeah. And also, he hasn't grown into that identity yet. This is his first attempt to burgle something, and it's been a dismal failure. So he reverts to describing himself in more familiar terms. And in so doing, accidentally becomes this, hob this hybrid thing, the Burra Hobbit, which is then played up here for comic effect uh, by, the, by the trolls. Right? Perhaps there are more like, him more like him around about, and we might make a pie, said Bert. Here, you. Are there any more of your sorts sneaking around in these here woods, getting nasty little rabbit? Said he, looking at the Hobbit's furry feet. And he picked him up by the toes and shook him. Yes, lots, said Bilbo before he remembered not to give his friends away. None, no, not at all, not one, he said immediately afterwards. Are both of these statements true? Yeah. There are a lot of hobbits, but none of them are there. Well, and also, there are dwarves, right? Yes, but none of them are there. The dwarves he came with, but no other hobbits here, right? So, this statement is slippery, right? Yes, lots. Sure, yeah, there, I, yeah my, my, I've got friends around, right? But no, none at all, not one. What do you mean, said Bert, holding him right way up by the hair this time. What I say, said Bilbo, gasping. And please don't cook me, kind sirs. I am a good cook myself, and cook better than I cook, if you see what I mean. I'll cook beautifully for you, a perfectly beautiful breakfast for you, if only you won't have me for supper. So he's also here playing on active and passive meanings of the word cook, right? Right. <clears throat> if you don't cook me, I will cook for you. So he's starting to find his footing here. when the trolls forget about him and start fighting each other, right? Yeah. But <clears throat> for the first half of the novel, right, a lot of this is Bilbo kind of trying to figure out his way around language and find his way through it. Now to point back to the riddle contest, Why does Bilbo win the contest? He lies. Well, not really lies. He doesn't really lie. He does right? wordplay. Where is he? Yeah. It's like bottom of the page. Oh. 79. Yeah. Yeah, so what's in his pocket? Yeah, it's what have I got in my pocket? Now, he does this simply because he can't think of anything else to say, right? And he's already answered several of Gollum's riddles purely by accident. But <clears throat> this is interesting in that it's an example of a tradition in folklore and myth called a neck wheel.
So here's how a neck riddle works, right? We find it frequently in uh, the Norse sagas, which is actually, uh, the Norse sagas are a big uh, general creative source for the hobbits. Um, all of the names of the dwarves are taken from a Norse poem called Voluspa, as is the name Gandalf, although in that poem Gandalf is one of the dwarves. Um, so a neck riddle is a riddle in which um, the person being asked the questions, life, it's, life is at stake, one. Secondly, it's a question that doesn't have a publicly available answer. So while it may not be a question that is absolutely impossible for the person asked to, uh, to answer correctly, it's an answer that is held only privately by one or a few people, right? So the classic example of this in North, uh, Norse mythology is um, Odin in disguise riddling with um, a giant who cleverly answers all of Odin's riddles until Odin asks him, what did Odin whisper into the ear of his son Balder on his funeral pyre? There's only one per, it's not a fair question, right? There's only one person who can know the answer to that question, and it's the person who asked it. Bilbo's what have I got in my pocket is exactly the same kind of neck riddle, right? Now, in this case, he's asking the question to save his neck rather than to um, <clears throat> take someone else's, to give, him, give him the right to take someone else's life, right? He, want, he, he doesn't want Gollum to eat him, and he wants Gollum to show him the way out. But this does bear a strong resemblance to that particular folklore tradition. Now, did you notice any particular pattern in the, uh, the riddles that are asked here? Teeth, eggs. Oh, teeth, yeah. Wind. Eggs, pattern. wind. So yeah, yeah, let's yeah, let's divide these up, right? By who asks what. So what are Gollum's riddles? What is Gollum? So the first one is mountain, right? Okay, yeah, that's one of Bilbo's, right? That's Bilbo's second one. So Bilbo's first one is teeth. The second one is sun on the daisies. Then Gollum's third riddle. It cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life, kills laughter. Dark. 
Yep. A box without hinges, key, or lid, yet golden treasure inside is hid. Eggs. Uh, yep, eggs. Eggs is. Yep, eggs is. <laughs> Alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking, all in mail, never clinking. Fish. Yep, that's a fish. And when he asks the fish riddle, right, fish is the thing that he usually eats. And at the same time, like to throw Bilbo off, is, is it nice, my precious? Is it juicy? Is it scrumptiously crunchable, right? He's treating Bilbo like a piece of food as well. No legs lay on one leg. Two legs sat near on three legs. Four legs got some. Fish on a little table, man sitting on a stool, the cat has the bones. So this to us doesn't seem like a particularly easy to answer riddle, but it's typical of the model of riddles that we saw in the Exeter book, right? When we're looking at Anglo-Saxon riddles early on. So the fish, man, cat riddle. This thing all things devours, birds, beasts, trees, flowers, gnaws iron, bites steel, grinds hard stones to meal, slays king, ruins town, and beats high mountain down. Mm. Yep, time. And this one, this is where Bilbo is really starting to slip up, right? Because he only answers this by accident. And then, the ring, the neck riddle, right, at the end. No, they're riddles about things I know about. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So yeah, this is, in particular, Gollum's, right? That he lives under a mountain in windy caves where it's dark. He subsists on a diet mostly of fish and goblin when he can catch one unawares. And time is basically meaningless to him, right? That's kind of the weird, it's, it's almost ironic that the last thing he asks about is time, because you've got this creature who seems to live in a kind of timeless world, right? Pardon? A void. Yeah. Whereas Bilbo's riddles all seem to kind of hit on memories that are distant for Gollum, right? Gollum doesn't have very many teeth. Thinking about the sun on the daisies makes him angry, right? If we look on uh, page 75, right? Said Gollum. He's also associated with these sibilant sounds, right? He had been underground a long time and was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the wretch would not be able to answer, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages before, when he lived with his grandmother in a hole in a bank by the river. S -s -s my precious, he said. Sun on the daisies, it means it does. But these ordinary above-ground, everyday sort of riddles were tiring for him. Also, they reminded him of days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty. And that put him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry. And a lot, of, a lot of the riddles reference eating in some way, right? Many of them are concerned with eating or with food, right? Even if the answer isn't directly concerned with eating or with food. But a lot of Gollum's... Um, a lot of Gollum's riddles themselves are concerned with biting and chewing and devouring, right? As we can see our Bilbo's. In fact, the sun on the daisies is just about the only, and the, the final neck riddle, or just, well, the final neck riddle is uh, what he says to avoid being eaten, right? 
but yeah, um, mo like most of these are thematically concerned with eating in some way. Right? <clears throat> Asked by one character who is hungry, by another who doesn't want to be eaten. So, it's also, I think, kind of important that in this chapter, this is both where Bilbo discovers the ring and remembers that he has a sword. If we want to go, you know, full Freudian here, um, if we look on page 69, right, he's looking for his pipe, when slapping all his pockets and feeling all around himself for matches, his hand came on the hilt of his little sword, the little dagger that he got from the trolls, and they had quite forgotten, nor fortunately had the goblins noticed it as he wore it inside his breeches. So, the interesting thing that happens here is like as he's like looking for his pipe and matches, right? Basically, the Hobbit equivalent of thumb sucking. He finds inside his pants a dagger, right? The sword being a common phallic symbol. So one impl possible implication of this, right, is that the situation is forcing him to, you know, quote unquote, man up. But he's also found this cold metal ring lying on the ground. And so while a phallic symbol is a symbol of masculine power, we call a symbol of feminine power a yonic symbol. So I think it's important to remember here that despite the lack of any female characters in the book, the thing that gives Bilbo Baggins his power and that helps him grow up and mature probably more than anything else is a ring which doesn't quite have yet the sinister connotations, right, that it will develop in the sequel. Here, it really is just a magic ring that he happens to find because Gollum got careless and lost it. Right, the larger significance of the ring hasn't been, um, hasn't really been um, brought out yet. Pardon? Uh, as I discussed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think partly because in 1937, when Tolkien is writing this, um, he doesn't quite have that concept yet, right? You know, this is just, this is a story that originates in an attempt to amuse his children at bedtime. One of his students um, <clears throat> reads some parts of it and thinks that it's really good, and so encourages him to get it published, right? Um, so the larger mythology, like even though there is this sort of kind of Silmarillion mythology at the back of it, right? Um, the larger Middle Earth mythology, especially of the Third Age, really isn't worked out yet. And in fact, it's not entirely clear um, that the First Age material that we looked at before the break is regarded as being all that far in the past at the time the Hobbit is first written. There's still this memory of right, the Goblin Wars and Gondolin um, and you know Bilbo even remembers this ancestor Bull Roarer took. Um, what was that? Uh, no, Bulwur Bul took is the guy who's large enough to ride a horse, which is unusual for a hobbit. And he, he, yes, he charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Graham on page 18 in the Battle of the Green Fields 
and knocked their king, Golfenbull's head clean off with a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole, and in this way the battle was won and the game of golf invented at the same moment. So, <clears throat> what these historical references do, so, you know, the bull roarer took The references to Gondolin, Goblin Wars. Right, we've seen we've already heard the Necromancer referenced once in the novel. There, there are references made to a war between the dwarves and the goblins, right? So what we can see here is that there is a kind of history of this world that is outside the plot of this single story, right? Now, this is a fairly common notion in, in fantasy writing that lar largely the Tolkien himself popularizes, right? Earlier fantasies don't do this much world building, and a lot of contemporary fantasies don't do this world building very convincingly, right? One of the things I think that makes Tolkien's world building in The Hobbit convincing is that these are just glancing references that the characters in the novel know what to do with, right? They understand what it means, but he doesn't go out and, you know, in this kind of lengthy disquisition to you about it, right? It's not like a whole digression. No, yeah, it's not a digression at all, right? It might come up in a conversation, right? It's not a Stephen King chapter. Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 there's no point in interrupting the narrative to explain a little bit of world building, right? Because then that's not effective world building. The whole point is to try to make the secondary world believable, right? That this is a world with its own history that is known to the people who live within it. And people who live in this world wouldn't need this explained to them, right? They know what Gondolin was. They know who the necromancer is, right? So we didn't end up talking about on fairy stories, right? But this is, uh, kind of develops one of the principles that he talks about here, right? You know, the, the secondary world has to create belief in order to be convincing, right? It has, you know, it, it has, or, or in order to provide you with the things that fantasy is supposed to give you, right? Which, you know, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail next time, right? But the first step is, yeah, that that secondary world has to create belief. So you have to give it a real history, a convincing history. And another thing that makes the history particularly convincing is that it's also relative. For example, to take the Goblin Wars. The elves call the swords that Bilbo and company find. Orcris. Yes, Orcris and Glamdring. Yes. Right, these appropriately Anglo-Saxony kind of sounding names for swords, right? Orcris the Goblin Cleaver. And Glamdring the Foe Hammer. So the elves give these swords these kind of poetic metaphorical names, right?
What do the goblins call these swords? Beater and bleeder. No. You're thinking you're, you're, all, you're, you're thinking along the right lines here. Beater, I know that. Beater and biter, right? So these are considerably less poetic names, right? The kinds of names that might be conceived by the people who were usually on the receiving end of those swords, right? Rather than actually making use of them. So these also fit in with the kind of general goblin practicality, right? We're told about goblins that they aren't particularly poetic people. But yeah, these are also yeah, the kind of names that the victims of said swords might come up with rather than the users. People who remember being beaten and bitten by them. Now we can see a similar Uh, relationship described when the Elven King captures the dwarves. Or if you look on page 168, right, the King's cave was his palace and the strong place of his treasure and the fortress of his people against their enemies. It was also the dungeon of his prisoners. So to the cave they dragged Thorin, not too gently, for they did not love dwarves and thought he was an enemy. In ancient days they had had wars with some of the dwarves, and they accused of stealing their treasure. It is only fair to say that the dwarves gave a different account, and said that they only took what was their, what was their due, for the elf king had bargained with them to shape his raw gold and silver, and had afterwards refused to give them their pay. So one other thing that makes the history convincing in The Hobbit, even, you know, for, you know, this, this is a book that's written essentially for eighth graders, right? The history is convincing in part because it's a matter of perspective. Right. While there may be agreement on the basic shape of events, different groups view those events through different prisms. Which indicates a level of complexity that in particular, Bilbo Baggins' neighborhood of cozy little kind of rural suburban hobbits, right? Doesn't really have, right? Again, like what, what's the, the, primary, uh, the primary virtues of the Baggins, right? Are that they're predictable and they're settled. In fact, the name of his home, Bag End, is a literal translation of the French cul-de-sac. And we all know what a cul-de-sac is, right, in like neighborhood design, right? It's one of those kind of like circle, like it's, it's, it's a neighborhood that empties out into a circle, right? So how is, this, how is a cul-de-sac like the end of a bag? Yeah, it's basically a dead end, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a dead end and it circles back in on itself. This kind of enclosed private world, right? 
where again, only Bilbo Baggins and his stuff live, right? And to get back to that idea of stuff, I think this is what we're probably going to finish on because I think it is an important, it's another important thing to understand about both this and the Lord of the Rings, right? Bilbo lives in this house all by himself and he's hoarding all of this stuff, right? What's so alarming about the arrival of all of these unexpected dwarves? They eat all of the food. Yeah, he has to feed all of them, right? And, you know, there's a ridiculous, there's a passage that sounds ridiculous, or that makes him sound ridiculous. On page 8. Right, he's surprised by Balin's entry. And he said, you know, Balin at your service, he said with his hand on his breast. Thank you, said Bilbo with a gasp. It was not the correct thing to say, but they have begun to arrive and flustered him badly. He liked visitors, but he liked to know them before they arrived, and he preferred to ask them himself. He had a horrible thought that the cakes might run short, and then he, as the host... He knew his duty and stuck to it, however painful. He might have to go without. So a lot of what we're going to see in Bilbo's mature, uh, maturing process is in addition to a growing control over and mastery of language, an ability to let go of things, to give things up, to renounce things. Right, so he gains the ring, and he gains maturity, but there are also a lot of things that he has to lose along the way. And that is, I think, like, in, like the journey really kind of starts here with his realization that he might have to go without cakes, right? Oh no, the horror. You know, <laughs> how many of us go without cakes every damn day, right? But... <laughs> Oh, I don't have any crackles in my chips. Or, yeah. Or uh, there's two times he's like, oh, I just wish I could be home in my chair with the kettle just singing. Or uh -huh. when, he, when he's in Rivendell, he's like, oh, this time of the year they would be hay making and butt berry making. Yeah. yeah he, he actually does have to leave without any of his stuff, right? Yeah. He doesn't have time to he, pack. He has he, to get out too quickly. He grabs his walking stick and yeah. that's about it. And there, there, there's, there's a point where he says, like, you know, he, he's angry about something the dwarves have said about him. And he says like, he, he would, he, that he decided he would go without breakfast to be thought fierce, right? <laughs> so what it is, you know, initially this kind of like silly bourgeois, you know, renunciation. You know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to give fried eggs up for Lent or something like that, right? Um, is uh, going to take on larger implications in the second half of the novel. All right, so that's all I've got for you guys for today. Do you have any questions about anything? How do you spell bourgeois? B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S. I knew I wouldn't be able to get it myself, so I had to ask. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I spelled it correctly. Bourgeoisie. Yes. Yes. At the same time, you kind of have to sympathize with Bilbo. If you had just settled down, uh -huh. for your tea, was nice and comfortable, uh -huh. and then all of a sudden, thirteen dwarfs and a wizard come in, you feel a little bad <laughs> too. Sure. Sure. That's like that's what okay, and I know how, how you feel about the movies, but that scene right there, like he had just settled down and <laughs> put lemon on his trout, uh -huh. and the door opens, and he's like, yeah, like I felt that. Well, you know, and, and one thing I, I will say, you know, Mark, Mark, I, Martin Freeman's performance, particularly in that movie, I think, is one of the few good things about those movies, and I think that the first movie gets the tone a little bit more right than the other two. I think that the third, I think, is the worst of them. Yeah, well. It never happened. Was it the Battle of the Five Armies? Yeah, in part because, well, because it's just constant slaughter of CGI constructs. <laughs> Did we get to keep up with this? Oh, yeah, yeah.
And even the, the, the second movie, there are moments like when they're riding the barrels down the river that felt like I was like, like I was watching someone else play a video game. Yeah, I know that. I, I feel like they were sponsored by GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> Do those shots. That, but at the same time, that would kind of be a fun ride. Too. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, well, that, that was what my wife's thought was theme park ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm waiting for the Universal ride on that one. <laughs>